listening to the Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm Rena Glazer. Welcome back. Today's guest is Annie Mohan from Cadwallader, Wickersham, and Taft. Annie spoke to us from New York City, where she is based. We discussed her career and role at the firm, her immigrant perspective, the legal community's response to 9-11, affinity networks and pro bono, and more. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Annie. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Rena. Happy to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm going to admit to feeling some extra pressure today, and that is pressure to be funny. You may remember a few weeks ago, we had an email exchange about something else, and you referred to this as a sitcom taping. <laughs> do, do you remember that? I did. Yeah. I did. So we already have theme music. In case anyone's wondering, it's called Uncle Ukulele, which is funny oh, in and of itself. But I've been thinking that maybe we need to add a laugh track or, or something like that. But we'll see. We'll do our best to keep everyone in, entertained and, and inspired. And informed. <laughs> Sounds good. Great. Well, let's jump right in. Annie, could you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you get to the firm and how did you become the manager of Pro Bono there? I started at Cadwallader back in 1998 and I started off in legal recruiting, helping, you know, in all aspects of recruiting, lateral and summer associate program. Um, and sort of just fell into doing pro bono in uh, 2004 when the uh, person who um, wasn't, you know, 100% on the uh, pro bono staff or department, which we really didn't have back then, she, I think, went on her honeymoon and asked if I would just sort of babysit this thing, pro bono, that I knew nothing of. And she got back from her honeymoon and never really took it back. And it sort of grew from there. Um, so it stayed on my plate. Um, and it was something that I realized I was interested in doing and learning more of. Once the firm realized that, you know, there was a growing interest by our attorneys to do pro bono and there was a need for support and infrastructure to manage that interest, I became the firm's first official uh, pro bono staff member and just sort of grew through the ranks and started managing the program a couple of years ago, taking ownership of, you know, the direction that pro bono would go at Cadwallader. So kind of proud of, you know, watching it sort of grow from a seed into what it's still blossoming, blossoming into. I love that story. The fact that your destiny rests in a honeymoon is adorable. Yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. All due to that happy couple. So, yes, who are still together. Thank oh, God. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. Thank goodness. A happy, happy outcome. Yes. So you mentioned that this was something that you were interested in. What do you think it was that attracted you to the pro bono program, whether it was your personality or your background or your values? What, what was interesting to you? So I think probably a combination of all of those. I am an immigrant to this country. I think that I'm very helpful and caring, and my parents have always sort of been givers and always taught us that if, you know, my sister and myself, that if we had, we sh we are expected to give. So I think just coming from that background and realizing that there was a need for, you know, services, whether legal or non-legal, because I also oversee the firm's community service programming, I just, I don't know, I just sort of was drawn to doing it and it was just so happy that a position like this existed in an organization that had the resources to do it on, you know, such a grand scale. So for people who aren't familiar with the details of Cudwallader, could you tell us a little bit more in general about the firm and the pro bono program? Cadwallader is the nation's oldest continuous running law firm. We've got over 200 years of legal experience and in innovation. And so it's one of the world's most prominent financial services law firm. And we've got, you know, longstanding relationships with premier financial institutions, leading corporations, you know, government entity, entities and individual private clients, healthcare organizations. So we sort of earned a reputation for crafting 
innovative business and financial solutions. So we like to think that we're a standout. In terms of our pro bono program, we've also got a longstanding tradition of providing uh, pro bono services to those in need. Uh, And the firm is committed to using its resources to uh, make a difference in our communities, you know, to help folks who could not otherwise afford legal representation. And I think our commitment is evidenced by the wide variety of uh, pro bono and community service projects that are undertaken by our attorneys, and we encourage both our new and experienced attorneys to give back through um, our pro bono and public service programs. Thank you for that, and we'll drill into some examples in a minute, but let's let's get back to you and talk about Annie. Okay. Okay. So sure. how do you spend your time? I would say a hundred of my time is spent overseeing you know, the the pro bono and public service initiatives. And I believe most of that time, um, if not all of it, is spent interacting with people, so attorneys, uh, staff, legal service providers, I guess sort of a plain matchmaker and trying to figure out, you know, how best I can get my attorneys to, to, you know, be engaged in our programming. I do wish I could have some more time to meet attorneys, especially, you know, our partners and more uh, senior attorneys and attorneys in other offices and really getting to know them, their interests, their expertise, and, you know, using that to tap into what they would be um, interested in um, doing in the pro bono and public service space. Do you do much traveling? Not much, but a few to our uh, U.S. offices, so Charlotte and D.C. So you mentioned that if you had more time, you would spend mm-hmm. it nurturing relationships, right? Talking to more lawyers, talking to more community right. groups, talking to more people. So yes. if you could do less of something, is there anything that you wish you could spend less of your time on? Yes, um, because I'm the only uh, pro bono staff member here, a lot of the, um, I guess, the administrative aspects of the program also are on my plate. So that's something I would love to see less of, um, especially surveys. Dear gosh, th- those surveys that come in at the beginning of the year, time consuming. Um, I know they're helpful. It would be great if someone just created a universal survey that everyone could use for pro bono. But until that happens, you know, the first quarter of my year is spent reworking the firm's statistics in every which way possible. So yeah, it's a little less of the administrative stuff and more of um, Um, focusing on relationships and just being a little bit more strategic in how we, um, you know, we I guess in how we direct our program. That's cool. And I'll confess to being a culprit because (laughs) we are are a surveyor. (laughs) So it's, it it is important. And we actually, we spend a lot of time not conducting surveys. You know, we we want Mm -hmm. so much information, but we just can't burden people. So it's a push pull. And I, I really respect that it's a, a challenge and a burden on people, and we try to be as judicious <laughs> as we can I be. I know, I yeah. know, and I, yeah. I, I think people are getting better. Definitely yeah. seeing a yeah. little bit more conformity in yeah. the, you know, the requests that we've been yeah. getting. Yeah. But I totally understand that they're useful and they're helpful, and they need to be done. <laughs> and maybe, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you asked. Well, fine. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, I opened it up. Total softball for you there. No problem. Yeah. Um, so to you, and this may change mm-hmm. over time, so I don't, you know, give as many answers as you would like, but what's the best yeah. part of your job? That's easy. I think it's the, the people that I get to work with and interact with, you know, our attorneys, our staff, legal service providers, pro bono resources like Pro Bono Institute. I, you know, one quote that we sort, I sort of grew up with is, and again, just my parents always reminding us how to, be, you know, to be helpful and that we're, we're capable of making change. And one quote that we sort of grew up with is, you know, never doubt that a small group of, and I'm maybe missing out words here, you know, thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world because it, you know, it's the only thing that can. So just sort of living that and seeing it every day is just, I don't know, in, an indescribable part of my job. It's just the best feeling to know that you are able to make change or encourage people to make change. And I just, I think that's what really draws me to doing this. 
Thank you for that. I think it's maybe from your parents by way of Margaret Mead. Something tells me that that's a a Margaret Mead Mm -hmm. quote that we see a lot because it resonates fantastically. And I actually thank you for the shout out to PBI, but I agree with that also. I'm I'm sort of knee deep in summer intern recruiting. So students want to know, right, what do you like about working at PBI? You know, what are your favorite aspects? And that is one of my favorite as well, that we get to work with people like you and other people at firms and in-house legal departments who are, you know, the best slice of our profession. <laughs> People Agreed. are Agreed. doing such sophisticated... No objection for me. Yeah, such sophisticated, amazing legal work and dedicate time, energy, and resources to access to justice and equal justice yes. under law. And it's, yeah. it's super inspiring and it's a real pleasure to be part of this community. So the flip side of our our positives discussion is a little bit of the glass half empty part, and that Mm -hmm. is, what for you are your greatest challenges? You know, I think, and I'm sure most people say this at firms, it's always trying to increase the number of people doing pro bono. Also for me, it's having been doing this for so many years, trying to stay innovative and creative and energetic and thinking outside the box. That might be my greatest challenge or challenges, just because, you know, I've been doing this for so many years and I always, feel, you know, you, you burn out. Um, you start to question, am I doing enough? Am I not, you know, should I be doing more? What should I be doing? You know, generations are changing. But what's always helpful is, you know, when there, whenever there's a pro bono conference or get together or gathering or meeting, I always walk away feeling re-energized and, you know, I can, I can do this. I can keep doing this. So, you know, the, the conferences and meetings are always helpful because people come make these great suggestions and have these great ideas and things that they're already doing. That's been help sort of keeping me on my toes and making sure that no one's really getting bored with doing pro bono. But again, and, and that this is sort of connected to trying to increase inter, uh, you know, attorney engagement here at Cadwallader. So again, just really trying to stay fresh after all these years, I guess, would be my uh, greatest challenge. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you in March at our conference. <laughs> yes, I'll be there. Yeah, I'll be there. It, it'll be great. And I hope that you'll get energized and get a lot of ideas. That is another thing that I actually love about this community is that Particularly law firms can be competitors in the marketplace, but they can be collaborators in pro bono. And I think people are are very quick to answer the phone, to answer an email, to speak up at conferences and say, hey, you know, this this worked for us. Maybe you could try it. Or, you know, I'm feeling a little been there, done that. Who can Mm -hmm. carry me? You know, who can kind of lift me up? And one of your colleagues... Oh, she actually has an episode, Terry Henley. You could look it up in our uh, yes. archives. Mm-hmm. She's amazing. And she has this great metaphor for the conference where she comes with her tank on E and she leaves with it on F. So she goes That's sort of from exactly empty to, to full, which is our hope. And I'm I'm glad it, it works. So. It really does. <laughs> That's it really awesome. does. And to your point about how collaborative the uh, pro bono community is, so that was actually one of the biggest surprises for me because coming from a recruiting background and then sort of having, you know, pro bono just, you know, fallen into my lap, I didn't know where to start. So I remember picking up, I don't know if it was a law firm directory of some sort and, well, I don't know that there were any pro bono ones back then. So I may have just been on the internet looking to see, are there people who do this at other firms? And I was so surprised at how sharing everyone was because, again, coming from recruiting where firms are competing for top candidates and tend not to be eager to share their trade secrets, so to speak, well, at least back then, it was just such a, you know, a refreshing surprise to see how welcoming everyone was. And I remember one of my first calls was to um, Tony Casino over mm-hmm. at Millbank. <laughs> you know, when I, I introduced myself and I said, oh, you know, I'm Annie and I'm going to be doing pro bono here at Cadwallader. And he's like, who are you? <laughs> um, but he, I mean, but that's Tony. And, you know, he was very welcoming and mentioned, you know, that there were a few New York pro bono people who would get together informally and just, you know, share stories and victories and best practices. And he invited me over to Bill um, Banks' office to take a look at how they were tracking pro bono and thought it would be great 
for me to, you know, to implement that at Cad Wallet, which I came back and I did. And, you know, that sort of core group of my mentors, I suppose, I'm still in touch with them and, you know, and you know most of them, Sarah Lynn and um, Allison King, they were all just really great in helping, you know, give me that foundation that I needed to grow through the ranks and um, be where I am today and I still call on them. Thank you for sharing that. And that compare and contrast with recruiting, I think, is very apt. So that gives yeah. <laughs> yeah. an excellent <laughs> perspective into the different uh, law firm worlds and, and how they do have different natures. So I wanted to drill down a little since you mentioned one of your challenges and I was hoping you could share some of the tricks or best practices that you've developed. And that is, in your experience, what have you found works best to incentivize and, cur- and encourage lawyers at your firm to, to do pro bono work? What, what, what does get them involved? I mean, I'll take any, anyone's incentive or motiv- motivation as long as they're doing pro bono. It's fine by me. Don't care what the motivation is. But I think what really I've seen work here at Cadwallader is people who have found some way to connect their personal interests and passion to, you know, giving back to pro bono. So one of the examples I love to use is a young associate here um, in our private client group. His name is Osvaldo Garcia. He, I can't remember what year he is now, but one as a junior associate when he started here at Cadwallader and realized that there, you know, and started talking to me about pro bono, he realized that there was such a great need for pro bono lawyers in the immigration space. Um, and he, being an immigrant and um, wanting to give back, thought that this might be where he could. And then he also realized that we had so many attorneys here at Cadwallader working on immigration pro bono matters, but they weren't really connecting with each other. So they weren't sharing their experiences or, you know, brainstorming together or giving, you know, I'm appearing before X judge and this is what he really likes. So this is what you should do. So they, they, they weren't really communicating. So he decided to make a proposal to our management committee to form what is now called our um, immigration clinic. And Osvaldo is a member of our Black and Latino Association here at Cadwallader. So they sort of, the members of that group, that affinity network, sort of all rallied behind his proposal and said that they'd support the formation of this immigration clinic here at Cadwallader. And two years ago, it came into fruition. And I think the reason why it's so successful is because of Osvaldo's experiences, um, you know, as an immigrant to the U.S. So the immigration clinic is sort of our in-house support system for attorneys who are handling pro bono immigration matters or interested in immigration matters. Um, So it's really a network that tapped into the wealth of experience we've accrued over the many years here at Cadwallader from handling these types of matters. And, you know, they coordinate training sessions. They've created a whole, um, you know, little library, internal library of resources that folks can be directed to if they've got questions. Um, I mean, it's just great. And again, I think it, it all stems from his being an immigrant, wanting to give back to people who were, in, you know, are in the situation that he was in at one point in his life. That is a really so, cool example of when passion meets purpose. Oh my and, gosh! If you met him, yeah, if he, yeah, he's just a ball of energy when he talks about immigration and the immigration clinic. So we're all so proud of him, and it's award winning. Um, he, I believe, it was the uh, New York State Bar Association that um, recognized him for his efforts, and the Hispanic National Bar Association also um, gave him an award last year. So we're so proud of him. That's amazing, and I I like how he was a driver, but also you were able to involve your Black and Latino group in the project. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. the firm's done that successfully with another group, the Women's Leadership Initiative. Correct. So tell me a little bit about that. First, what's the Women's Leadership Initiative, and then what's the pro bono project that they launched? Sure. So uh, so just to give a little background, um, all our uh, five affinity networks at Cadwallader all have uh, to create business plans, and those all have to have some charitable aspect. 
So in the, uh, you know, the Black and Latino Association, Osvaldo's um, project became sort of their, their baby. For the Women's Leadership Initiative, when we met, and I, I met with the co-chairs of all the um, affinity networks at Cadwallader um, to sort of figure out, you know, are we doing things that they can get behind to really improve and expand our impact, or do they want to start with something new? So our Women's Leadership Initiative, and we had worked with the Legal Aid Society. We've been working with them for several years, but a couple of years ago, we had started sort of a first-year litigation um, training project with them where we were representing clients um, in public housing who were being threatened with termination of their tenancy, and it was very well received by our litigation group, and it sort of just, you know, became another opportunity that we offered to our associates. So the Women's Leadership Initiative, which is, again, the affinity network here at Cadwallader that provides support to our women attorneys, they wanted to explore that project again and sort of making it more, I guess, refining it a little more just to include low-income women who are in public housing and threatened with termination of tenancy, but the they didn't limit the attorneys that could participate to just women attorneys. It was open to all attorneys at the firm, and the Women Leadership Initiative would host, um, you know, I think it's bi-monthly meetings where everyone working on one of these cases would be in a room with the partner supervisor and talking about their cases and their experiences. So, you know, in addition to giving back to, you know, the community in such a, a great way, the cases do provide them with great professional development opportunities, you know, they get to interview a client, review documentary evidence, engage in negotiations, and, you know, work with that client, prepare them for testimony, and then represent them at an administrative proceeding. And the project has been very successful. Um, It's been, I believe, for over about two and a half years now. And the outcome of these cases, you know, preserving our clients' home has made a huge difference in the lives of these women and their families, Um, you know, particularly at a time when affordable housing in New York City is in such short supply. So, you know, we're we're loving how it's growing and expanding. So we actually have our first meeting of the year scheduled for next week, and it looks like everyone's showing up. So that's always a good sign. We love projects that have impact and make a difference in the community, which that definitely does. But I love the innovation of having it um, be organized around your affinity networks. I think that's a real innovation that other firms Mm -hmm. are kind of realizing that they have these groups and that they can do social things and they can do business development and they can do networking and they can also do pro bono. And it's a great, great tie-in. It's almost like low-hanging fruit, right? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. We'll take it. It's fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yep. So another innovative project that the firm has created and administered works to confront modern slavery in America. Could you tell us about this? Sure. So this was started a couple of years ago, and um, it focuses on domestic trafficking, which, you know, most people, when we think of human trafficking, we sort of tend to think of it, you know, on a global scale, but it is a huge issue um, in the U.S. So first is is a targeted campaign to raise awareness about human trafficking, and it's a really collaborative-based project, I would say, and it's sort of a unique model of advocacy and coalition building. Um, So we've created this fabulous uh, website, uh, vsconference.org, and what it does is really um, provide legal resources, uh, shares innovative models, and just really provides information to prevent modern slavery and protect victims and survivors of uh, human trafficking in the U.S. And it's a fabulous site. I highly recommend that everyone checks it out. So it's really geared to everyone in the, uh, you know, domestic human trafficking space. Could you give us the website again just so people can look it up? Sure. It's vsconfronts, with an S, dot org. Great. Thank you for that. Are there some other examples of pro bono matters that the firm has worked on for whatever reason have been particularly meaningful or resonated with you that you could share with us? I would say our post-9-11 relief efforts. 
So we've always been a downtown firm. And like I said, I started at Cadwallader several, several years ago. And we were personally affected by the 9-11 attacks. So that sort of comes to mind. So in the immediate aftermath of the attacks, we committed substantial funds to help restore and rebuild and revive the downtown area. And we also, you know, the firm stepped up and made significant donations to organizations um, for disaster relief and recovery efforts as well and encouraged its employees to do the same. Um, We were also a leader in the, you know, the New York City legal community's response to the attacks and registered with the New York State Bar Association to provide um, consultations and representation of uh, victims of the attacks and offer to handle any legal needs related to, you know, real estate, trusts and estates, and litigation for individuals and small businesses. We also provided free legal services to families of I believe it was Ladder 11, the New York City Fire Department. They lost six firefighters at the World Trade Center. And we also played a role in creating a handbook of public and private assistance resources for uh, victims and families of the attacks. So um, we continue to do some work on that. Um, Most of it has um, obviously died down after all these years, but that was really one of our... um, you know, most significant contributions to New York City. And, you know, it also sort of helped to shape how I think of pro bono. Um, And again, that whole idea of people collaborating and coming together in time of need couldn't be more evident than, you know, post 9-11. Oh, thank you for sharing. That's such a wonderful example. And it's actually bringing back very vivid memories of standing with you in your office, overlooking because, you know, literally you are right there and your views are um, the memorial and and things they were building, you know. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a somber reminder of that time. But it's so good to see how New York City has bounced back from that and, um, you know, Obviously, the, our legal community played a part in that. They're really proud of how far we've come. Yeah, it's definitely a message of resilience, and uh, it's very powerful. So thank you. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. As yeah. you mentioned, you've been in your pro bono yeah. position since about 2004. So mm-hmm. looking back, that's it's been a while. <laughs> what, uh-huh. what have been your biggest surprises? What do you know now that you wish you knew then? I, I would say, again, just the collaborative nature of the whole law firm pro bono world, it still surprises me as much as it surprised me back then. And, you know, I I sit back and think of all the time I sort of wasted just sort of trying to figure it all out on my own when I could have really just picked up the phone and called all these wonderful people out there. Obviously, there are much more of us um, now back you know, unlike back in, uh, you know, 2004, over a decade ago. But I, I think really it's just the collaborative nature of law firm pro bono. It's just I've never really seen it elsewhere. So that still surprises me. Um, and, yeah, I guess if I there was something I knew um, now that I wish I knew back then is just how helpful people are. But I guess sort of coming from that recruiting frame of mine, it wasn't um, something that even crossed my mind that folks out there would be willing to help me build an entire program. What do you think's changed, if anything, during this decade in either legal needs, sort of new areas of pro bono practice, or the interests of your lawyers, or have, have things changed that you've seen looking back and saying, huh, it's not really like that now? Things are different, or do you think you know steady state? Things are pretty much same old, same old. No, I, I think it, I think it's changed all for the better. I do think um, firms are recognizing you know the significance of pro bono and having a pro bono program, and I think firms that may have been doing it for several years are finding ways to leverage it, whether it be you know in recruiting or training or BD or whatever purpose. But uh, you know, and that doesn't bother me at all because I just, you know, I just think it even makes it more valuable and gives me more leverage in what I ask for from a firm in terms of resources. So I definitely think, you know, I, at least at Cadwallader, I've definitely seen 
the value of pro bono growing, and I don't see that it will stop. I, I just feel that people are re- realizing that, you know, the firm does this, the firm supports it. Um, I just think that the our younger generation of attorneys coming in, they're so much more, I guess, socially conscious, you know, no, no offense to all their attorneys, but you know, I just feel that the attorneys that are coming in now sort of expect that a firm will allow them to use their fabulous law degrees to give back. So I, you know, the value of pro bono I see is just increasing. Amazing. So we've done a little bit of looking back. Now let's look to the future. What's on the horizon for the pro bono program? Tell us like something new that's in the works or a short-term or long-term goal that you have. For our first quarter of 2017, uh, we are launching two new partnerships with in-house legal departments. So we are very excited about those, and I'm busy event planning for those launches. I would say, you know, our and that's something that we've been doing a lot of is just really collaborating um, not just with our affinity networks, but with our in-house legal department who, you know, they've got fabulous attorneys who are also willing to give back. My goal is really to sustain those meaningful and impactful collaborations and to continue to explore, you know, any untapped resources that can help with uh, bridging the access to justice gap. That's amazing. Well, good luck with the in-house partnership launches, and we will have to follow up with you, hear how they're doing. Yes. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we will. We'll get an update. Okay. Yeah. Annie, if you had a magic wand, what one thing would you change about your firm's pro bono program? I might get in trouble for this, but if I had a wand, I would say I would love to have a mandatory pro bono requirement here at Get Wallet Air. and it wouldn't have to be something big, just something small, but something. Um, and so why? Why is that your wish? Because I think I've noticed that people tend to think that pro bono might be life-size and really take over their world. But I feel like once someone starts doing it and realizes, oh, this is manageable with my workload, they, they become hooked. And there's no way for me to really get them or really to hook them in. But I think if there was a mandatory requirement that I could really use to to push people to do pro bono, that would be helpful. Sure. So you view it as a technique, as an on-ramp. It would kind of get people up to speed and on the fold, and then they'd kind of keep on keeping on. and Doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Interesting take. So thank you for sharing. All right. Let's end with this. You've mentioned a number of colleagues. We've talked about them. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, And so maybe you've already answered, or maybe you've got some new names for us, but who's Uh your pro bono role model and why? I would say my role models are our clients, and I know it might probably sound contrived, but if you know me, which you kind of do, <laughs> uh-huh. you'll know that it's not. I just think, I, mean, I, I honestly cannot think of a stronger group of people learning about the challenges and adversities some of our clients have had to overcome has really helped to put my own life into perspective and shape how I live and how I do this job. And I appreciate that. You know, I honestly think that our pro bono clients have made me into just a better person or a human. I know that kind of sounds silly, but yeah, yeah, I'd have to say it's our pro bono clients. That's amazing. I don't think that sounds silly. I think that sounds human. And I Uh think that's a wonderful and inspiring testament to the dignity of our clients. It's, It's a fantastic take. Absolutely. Thanks. Good. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Annie, well, thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, too. Hope I've answered all your questions and hopefully inspired others to, to, you know, get involved and give give back in whatever shape, form that they can. I know, like I said, my parents were uh, my big inspiration and um, instilled in me values that I'm able to, to use as a foundation for doing this job and hopefully doing it well. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to Annie for joining us today. To learn more about us, our work, and the PBI Annual Conference, which will take place on March 8th through 10th in Washington, D.C., please visit our website, probonoinst.org. You'll find quick links to conference agendas, registration, and sponsorship opportunities. As always, we're grateful for your generous support 
which makes our work possible. We'd love to hear from you. Send your comments, feedback, and suggestions to pro bono at probonoinst.org. New and archived episodes of the podcast can be found on iTunes and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And please take a moment to leave an iTunes review. We'd appreciate the feedback and it would help make it easier for other listeners to find the show. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on the Pro Bono Happy Hour.